Thank you very much, Julia, and, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, to speak today. Um, to, today's presentation, or th th this afternoon's presentation, is on introduction to failure analysis of plastic components, and it is it is just that it is an introduction uh, to failure analysis. Uh, you know, the amount of time we have uh, doesn't allow us to get uh, too deep into into any of the topics. Uh, but what we're going to walk through today is we're going to understand what is meant by failure. We're going to review the failures in plastic part performance. We're going to look at the uh, failure analysis process. And then we're going to review a couple of case studies to, to help illustrate those points, I think. Uh, first of all, let's jump right in. But we want to uh, kind of define what we mean by failure. There's a number of different ways that we can define it, an undesirable event or condition the inability of the component uh, to, to function properly, uh, a component that no longer performs as intended. Um, and, and so all these things really mean that something's not working the way it was originally intended to work. And that may be a, a catastrophic break or a failure. It may be something more mundane like a cosmetic change or an appearance change. Uh, but again, it, it's just not, it's not uh, performing the way it was intended. That can really come in three different uh, types of scenarios. Uh, the part is completely inoperable. So we've got a gear, uh, a plastic gear that's in a component. Uh, the plastic gear breaks. And because of that, then uh, there really is no functionality left. Uh, number two would be the part is operable, but not fully functional. And uh, for this, uh, let's think about a cell phone uh, or other handheld device. Uh, if, uh, if the cover becomes cracked, uh, it's likely that the part will still operate but it's not fully functional. It's not, uh, the cover is not serving its full protection, uh, you know, that it would. It, it could be, the internal components could be exposed to the elements. And also, it's, it's not aesthetically uh, what, it, what it should be. So that's kind of uh, the second scenario. And finally, the, the part is functional, but it has been compromised and is unreliable or unsafe for continued use. Um, you know, a, a clear example there is of a uh, polyethylene uh, uh, transmission gas line uh, that might be buried underground. Uh, the part might not be cracked, it might not be broken, but if it's deemed to have been compromised, uh, then certainly uh, it has failed uh, because it's no longer safe and, and has to be replaced. So those are the three different types of failure uh, that we can get. Um, we typically, and I show this because we, we typically see failures at really three different stages in the life cycle of a product. We see failures early on. Uh, maybe just shortly after production or, for, or shortly after a new product has been released. And those are, are typically deemed as defective products. Something's gone wrong um, either during, uh, uh, during manufacturing or, or, or during assembly or something, and those products fail relatively early. Uh, and they may represent a relatively high rate of the dropout failures. Then over the life of the, over the, life of the curve, Over the life of the curve, uh, the, the lifetime, we're going to see random failures. So something that happens out in the field or, or something unusual that happens and causes some, some sporadic failure rate. And that is generally low uh, and varies. Then finally, as we get to the end of the, of the product life cycle, we start to see expiration. And this is where the product just simply, um, you know, 
gives up the ghost. It just doesn't, it, it, it's losing its lifetime, uh, and we see that an increasing rate of failures at that point also. Typically, for plastic part failure, we see failures in, in a number of categories, and they tend to, to, to drop out as such. We, stand, we tend to see some deformation or some distortion, so some change in dimensions. That could be one type of failure. We, uh, another type of failure is aesthetic alteration. Something either changes color, uh, it, it, uh, it uh, may become cloudy if it's a clear part, uh, but something aesthetically then uh, uh, goes wrong. Uh, we see degradation so that the part becomes inherently brittle. Uh, it doesn't have the integrity it once had. We see wear uh, within a plastic component, and then we also see fracture. Now today we're going to talk principally about that last uh, uh, failure mode. We're going to talk about fracture when something actually cracks. That's going to be principally what we talk about. Um, in order to kind of get started and gain a basic understanding, we're going to need to talk about the factors that are important in plastic part performance. And there are five factors that, that really determine how that plastic material will perform. And that's the material, the design, the processing, the installation, and the service conditions. Any type of, of, of performance uh, can be traced back, or problems in performance can be traced back to one, of, one or more of these five different uh, performance factors. And we need to think about them acting together. In fact, that's what this diagram is meant to be. We have our design, our fabrication, our material. That really, that's the, the part. That's our as produced molded part or formed part. Then we take that and we install it into the in-service environment, and now we've got all five things coming together, and that's the way we need to think about it. Um, it's not just not just design, not just fabrication, not just material, but it's 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 all five of those things acting together um, on the on our you know on our uh, on our part. Those five factors coming together to determine how well that part will perform in service. The first of those is going to be material-related factors. And, and we can divide that really into two different areas, the first of which is composition. And, and the first area under that is going to be the base polymer. Are we talking about polyacetal? Are we talking about polycarbonate? Are we talking about polyethylene? Um, that's determined, again, by the structure and the functional groups that, are, in the, that are, in, are within the polymer. And that really sets the tone for the performance. It sets the tone for chemical resistance, uh, the kind of the, the temperature window it can be operated at. It goes a long way to determine the mechanical properties of the part. So that, that, what that base polymer is, again, really goes a long way to determine the performance. Also, do we have a homopolymer? Do we have a copolymer? Do we have a blend? Do we have an alloy? What type of material do we have? What is that base polymer? Another is intentional additives, things like anti-degradants, like antioxidants, colorants, pigments, <laughs> filler materials, reinforcement. All those, all of those intentional ingredients will help to determine how that plastic part performs in service. And finally, contamination. While no one actually needs to put contamination in their plastic part, it certainly does find its way there and will go a long way to bringing down the performance uh, of the plastic part. So we need to think about unintentional contamination as also part of that composition. The other half of that material factor is then molecular structure. Things like average molecular weight, molecular weight distribution, cross-linking. So do we have a thermoplastic or a thermoset material? The level of crystallinity. So is it amorphous or semi-crystalline? The branching. Things like that. All of those determine the molecular structure. If you're used to working with metal parts, um, this molecular structure is not something that you need to worry about at all. It's unique to polymeric materials. So, uh, but again, very, very important in determining how that, how that plastic part is going to perform uh, in service. So you can see by, by putting these different things together in different ways, we can, we can come up with a variety of different plastic components, which all have very different performance properties. The three most important uh, parameters related to plastic part performance, and I, I say that half tongue in cheek, but it's very, very important, is molecular weight. Very, very important. In fact, this is where I typically get on my soapbox a little bit and in, in, in talk about the importance of molecular weight to polymeric materials. We're going to flash back a little bit to Chemistry 101. We're going to have to understand what molecular weight is. It's simply the, the sum of the atomic weights of the atoms in a molecule. So for water, we have one oxygen at 16, two hydrogens, one each is 18. For sodium chloride, 23 plus 35 is 58. That means that 18 grams of water and 58 grams of sodium chloride represent a mole. And a mole is simply 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecule. So 
again, amounts that you can certainly fit in the palm of your hand, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. It's, it's a lot of molecules. So with a polymeric material like, like polyethylene, it's a little more complicated to, to figure out the, uh, the molecular weight, but it's simply we, we just take the, the repeating unit, in this case, uh, two carbons with, uh, with pendant hydrogens, and we add those together. The same for polycarbonate, a much more complicated structure. But again, adding all the, the carbon, the hydrogens, the oxygens, adding those all up together, multiplying by the number of repeating units in a row, and we get the average molecular weight of the material. Well, where, where are we going with this? Again, sodium chloride, water, amounts you can fit in the palm of your hand, which have a mole of material. Those same number of molecules, that same mole, for polyethylene would take a skid of molding resin. And for polycarbonate, not quite as much a bag of molding resin. The point I guess I'm trying to make here is that, that these molecules are very, very large relative to, um, relative to, uh, to normal molecules like, like water and sodium chloride. These, these molecules are very, very large. And that's what gives polymeric materials their rather unique set of properties is the size of their molecules. Most commercial polymers have average molecular weights between 10,000 and 500,000. Uh, ultra high molecular weight can go to four to six million. So again, extremely large, and that's what makes them unique. Starting to illustrate what that, that molecular weight, the impact of that molecular weight is, on the high end, if I, if, I, if I stay with something like a hydrocarbon structure, on the high molecular weight side, I'm gonna have something like high density polyethylene. And if I, you know, if I, if I had a, poly, a high density polyethylene rod, and if I were strong enough, I could tie that in a pretzel knot, and it wouldn't break. It would be very hard to do, but, but it wouldn't break. If I do nothing but reduce the molecular weight of that material, not change the structure at all, but simply reduce the molecular weight, I will end up with something that, that, that's a lot like candle wax. And if you've, if you've ever, you know, touched a candle, if you've ever messed with a candle, you know that it doesn't take much deflection at all for that candle to break in a relatively brittle manner. Certainly can't tie it in a pretzel knot. That change in performance has got everything to do with molecular weight. That's the only thing that's different about those materials is that molecular weight. So you can see that the implications of molecular weight are, are, are quite significant. Molecular weight is the true free, free lunch in plastic part performance. All properties increase when I select a, a higher molecular weight resin. So if I've got a choice, say I'm, I'm making something out of polycarbonate, and I, I have a choice between two different resins, one higher molecular weight, one lower molecular weight. If I choose the higher molecular weight material, my tensile strength will be better, my elongation at break will be better. That's one of the only times that those two properties travel in the same direction. Okay, it's, usually there's a trade-off there. My yield strength will be higher, I'll get superior toughness and hardness. I get better abrasion resistance. The softening temperature will go up. And one very important, often overlooked aspect is my chemical resistance will also improve. So everything gets better when I, when I pick that higher molecular weight material, provided I mold it correctly, okay? There's the, there's the rub, is that higher molecular weight materials can be more difficult to injection mold, okay? They can be harder to mold. But I always urge people to, to challenge their molder to to be able to, you know, work on their on their press, work on their settings in order to be able to mold uh, that highest molecular weight uh, resin uh, possible. So uh, again, all the properties improve. Our next area is design-related factors. There are a lot of things about design that affect the performance. So certainly, I consider material selection to be part of design because when I think about a design, I've got to make it out of something. So what I make it out of. That selection process is part of the design process, I think. Then we've got wall thicknesses, ribs, bosses, threads, and holes, a lot of different things that, again, about the design. Um, we've got snap fits and inserts. Snap fits very, very important because um, I have a number of, of clients that if they can install their plastic part with their snap fit, that's the most rigorous mechanical demand that the part will undergo in its lifetime. There's not an awful lot of deformation there, but it happens almost instantaneously. So the strain rate is extremely high. And so because of the molecular structure, polymeric materials are strain rate dependent. And so it, it's very possible that a part can crack through a snap fit, um, a snap fit. So you're very, very cautious when it comes to that design. Um, and then we talk about flow and gating and venting, uh, things about the tooling. You can design the world's greatest plastic part, but if you can't mold it 
it doesn't really do you any good. So I, I urge people when they're looking at plastic designs to bring the tooling people in on the very first conversation. Uh, this is not something you want to throw over the cubicle wall and throw at somebody. It's something you want to bring those tooling people in at the very front side. Again, a lot of good plastic designs can lead to failure because, because the tooling just can't be done and done properly. Small alterations in the design could accommodate for that. So again, I urge you, bring those, uh, bring those tooling people in at the very front side. So again, more things about design. Uh, the things that, that can go wrong, okay, poor material selection or specification, inadequate corners or radiuses, non-uniform wall thicknesses or insufficient wall thicknesses, poor thread designs which lead to high stress concentration, designing for metal, the number one cause of, 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 of plastic part conversion to go wrong is leaving the design the same, you know, when it used to be a metal design, and now making it, the, making it out of plastic and just leaving that design the same because those two materials, metal and plastic, need different things in terms of design. Different things are important. Improper consideration for service, you know, thinking about chemical contact, uh, creep or static stresses, fatigue, impact, again, high strain rates, those kinds of things. All of these things can lead to premature plastic part failure. Things that can go, you know, with the tooling design, certainly you can get warpage, poor fusion, trapped air, rapid or uneven cooling, which can lead to problems in the part. So a lot of things about design and tooling design that have a, a significant impact on that plastic part performance. Uh, this is just a general rule of thumb. Again, you want to not have those, those sharp corners. You want to, to round those out. You also want to flow from thin wall sections to thick wall sections. And generally, you want to have relatively uniform wall thickness. Okay? That uh, big, uh, that part on top here, the big blue part on top, that's a classic metal design. War material is better. It's certainly, you know, in a metal design, it's going to be stronger. In a plastic part, we want to design something like on the bottom. We want to have nice uniform wall thicknesses. That big, thick wall is going to likely lead to shrink, molded in stresses that are going to be a problem for that part during service. So, again, uniform wall thicknesses, designing plastic and metal parts in different ways. Next is processing. So we've got our, uh, we, we've got a material, we've got a design, well, now we've got to make that part. We've got to process it. So. It's not just about molding, it's about things that happen before and after the molding process also, okay? So before we form it, we're gonna have to do something maybe like compound or mix it. So if we've got a, you know, plastic materials tend to be somewhere between three and six ingredients, we've gotta get those ingredients to come together. How are we mixing it? During that mixing or compounding, we may expose it to, to elevated shear, the temperatures that might be a problem. We also, in many cases, have to dry material. Polycarbonate needs to be dried to a moisture content of 0.02% prior to molding, or otherwise the, the, uh, the material will undergo hydrolysis and be inherently brittle. So we, we need to dry it. But that can, again, if we don't properly dry it, that could be a problem. Or if we expose it to elevated temperatures, can, we can actually degrade it during the drying process. Then we form it. We've got a whole different lot of, you know, we've got a lot of different ways we can do that. Injection molded, rotational molded, extrusion. There's, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. And they each have their own characteristics in terms of what they bring uh, to the, to the final part. And also their own stresses that they can, they can impact on the part. Then things we might do after the part's been formed. We might need to cut it or machine it or join it, whether that be bonding or solvent welding or, or something like that. We might paint it, we might plate it, we might even sterilize it. So lots of different things. Again, all of these things exposing it to, to stresses. And by stresses, I just don't mean mechanical stresses. I mean chemical stresses, temperature stresses, uh, as well as mechanical. So uh, lots of different things that you can do to that material, which can alter it, which could degrade it, which could make it not perform as well out in the field. During fabrication, again, lots of different things to think about. Uh, all of those come together and they affect the dispersion, the warpage or distortion, the crystallinity. You may get inhomogeneity, so the material's not properly mixed. You may have like so, something like uh, pigment agglomerations or something like that. Um, the fill level, you might have short shots. Uh, contamination, degree of fusion or knit lines, very, very important in plastic parts, uh, that that material be properly fused. You can degrade the material during that fabrication process, and you can certainly get defects like voids or inclusions. So um, the fabrication process, very, very important. And again, a lot of things that can happen which can negatively affect uh, plastic part performance. And next, we go to installation. 
And uh, there are a number of examples of, of where installation can be important, certainly in plumbing parts where, where pipe valves or fittings, pumps are installed after they're manufactured. Electrical components, again, that are installed after they're made at the factory that go out to the service site and then get installed. Medical implants, certainly that's a very good example. Those, those are installed during an operation. Automotive parts, replacement parts, non-factory uh, assembled options, and articles that are fastened in the field. Again, anything where, where installation into the final service environment occurs, again, lots of things that can happen. You can get damage through handling. You can have misalignment. So think about, uh, in this case, a piping system where you, you're going to join two sets of pipes with a fitting. Uh, if they're not aligned property, uh, properly, there can be uh, a lot of stress on that, uh, on that junction. Uh, you can get excessive tightening, improper or inadequate adhesive application, poor welding parameters for things that are joined out in the field, and damage associated with simultaneous installation of adjacent uh, components where there might be some chemicals or something used or, or other components might be cleaned and those chemicals get onto the, uh, the component that's already in service or being, uh, being installed. Finally, the service conditions. This is the, the factor that as a manufacturer of plastic parts, you have the least amount of control over. Probably keeps you up at night. What, what is my customer doing to this part? What are they going to expose it to? What don't I know about? So uh, a lot of different things to think about. The service environment includes the temperature. Are, is, is your part going to operate at elevated temperature? Or is it going to be at subambient temperature? Is it going to be static? Or is it going to cycle uh, back and forth through temperature? Uh, what are the applied loads? Are they static? Are they dynamic? Are they are these are impact uh, internal versus external? So again, um, internal being internal to the assembly or to the component, external being something that's applied to it from the outside. A chemical contact. We have to worry about environmental stress cracking or molecular degradation. What is somebody going to clean this product with, or what's somebody going to clean the next product over with that's going to accidentally splash on it? What could happen there? Then we've got it if it's used outside, you might see ultraviolet radiation. Uh, you might have rain or pollution uh, that could certainly affect the, the performance of the part. Uh, also then time, very, very important uh, factor for plastic parts. Um, how long do you expect this plastic part uh, to perform? Is this a, a two-year part that uh, you know, essentially gets thrown away? Uh, is it a five-year part, a ten-year part, or is it something like uh, that might be used in the uh, electrical distribution industry, which requires a hundred use, a hundred, excuse me, a hundred years of continual service? So, how long do we expect that that's going to survive? And then finally, combinational stresses. These are multiplicative, not additive. So, things like exposure to elevated temperature while under uh, static stresses, while in chemical contact. Okay. Uh, while simultaneously outside in, in, the, in the UV exposure. So all of those things don't add 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4. They really, they really are multiplied. And so um, you really need to think about exponentially, my part is going to now be under much more severe uh, conditions uh, than if it were just under one of those. So uh, these are things to think about, about placing a part out into the field and, and what, uh, what it's exposed to. Um, after it's after it's been installed, after it's after it's up and running. Again, just a, a slide to, to show that we need to remember those five factors and how they act uh, in concert, uh, not how they act individually on that uh, on that plastic part. Let's talk a little bit about now cracking and what that means. The characteristics of plastic cracking are that covalent polymer uh, backbone bonds are not broken by mechanical forces. So um, think about your, your molded plastic part like a bowl of spaghetti noodles. The spaghetti noodles each represent those, those polymer chains, okay? And um, those spaghetti noodles or the, the polymer chains are all entangled into one another. What happens then is not that we rip those spaghetti noodles apart so that we tear individual noodles apart, we tear individual polymer chains apart. Instead, uh, what happens is that uh, we fail uh, through a disentanglement mechanism in which polymer chains slide past one another. So again, the, sp the, sp the spaghetti noodles, the bowl of spaghetti noodles, we're pulling one noodle at a time and we're pulling those noodles past one another. We're pulling those polymer chains through force past one another and they disentangle. They undergo, again, this disentanglement mechanism. 
applied stress, both internal and external, and again, internal, that, that can mean molded in residual stress, as well as externally applied stresses, overcome intermolecular forces, including van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, dipole interactions, a number of different intermolecular forces which hold those molecules together. Uh, with the bolus began units, we're overcoming friction. With uh, plastic molecules, we're overcoming these intermolecular forces. Uh, the mechanism is the same whether we have an amorphous material like polycarbonate or polystyrene or semi-crystalline materials such as nylon, uh, polyethylene, polypropylene. Yeah, the mechanism is essentially the same. We're going to look now at, at, at a stress-strain curve um, on a, in a case of uh, pipe pressurization. And I think that rather than looking at a dog bone, this, this really illustrates what happens during, um, during um, uh, the application of stress. So as we're going to look at a, on a macro level, we're going to look at, at, say, our pipe and cross section. We're also on a microscopic level going to look at a molecular structure. Here we've got a semi-crystalline material with a very crystalline uh, orderly structure uh, over part of it. That would be something like uh, high-density polyethylene or nylon. But yet there's a significant amount of amorphous content in the middle here. These are called tie molecules, um, and they um, because even the most crystalline of polymeric material still has a significant amount of amorphous material in it. So as we start our stress strain, as we start to pressurize our, our pipe in this case, we'll uh, go through the linear elastic deformation and then nonlinear elastic deformation. On a macroscopic level, there's not much observable change. Okay, If we were to release the, uh, the pressure, if we were to depressurize at this point, we'd pretty much get full recovery and we wouldn't see much change. And there's not much change on a, on a microscopic molecular level either. Okay. However, once we go through yielding, now we're going to see that the, uh, there's a permanent change uh, within, the, uh, within the pipe. We're going to see that the wall gets a little thinner. We're going to see uh, permanently, a permanent expansion. On a molecular level, we're going to see that these tie molecules within the center start to orient themselves. They start to stretch out and orient themselves. We go through some necking then and plastic deformation. If we were looking at a tensile bar, we'd see that that plastic part was then stress whitened. The same here would, would happen with, with our pipe section. And again, further evidence of, of permanent deformation. On a, a molecular level, once the tie molecules are all oriented, now we're going to start to see uh, that the, even the crystalline structure starts to basically start to come apart. It starts to slide past one another. With continued application of stress, then we get failure to occur. We get breakage within our plastic component. And again, how that works is we've got individual molecules that have slid apart, slid past one another uh, until, uh, until they've come apart. Cracking doesn't, when we think about cracking, it doesn't need to be extremely complicated. Cracking is simply a response to stress. It occurs as a stress relief mechanism. The plastic part is under stress, and in order to relieve the stress, it undergoes cracking. We get ductile fracture as a bulk molecular response through yielding. So we get that permanent deformation, we get stress whitening, um, and we get that uh, macro molecular rearrangement, which is then followed by disentanglement. Brittle fracture, in contrast, is a localized molecular response whereby we get no yielding. There is no yielding to the part. There's no permanent stretching. There's no um, a significant stress whitening. And we simply go to disentanglement. Uh, so a slightly different uh, steps in the, uh, in the failure. But nonetheless, the failure is through disentanglement, polymer chain sliding past one another. Uh, a study was done um, in Europe of about 5,000 failures a while ago, and they looked at the uh, the types of, of failure mechanisms that were that played an important role in plastic part failure. And uh, the number one cause of plastic part failure was environmental stress cracking. And I would certainly say that that's true. I've conducted about uh, about a thousand, a little over a thousand failure investigations, uh, and I would say that that's right on the money. Approximately 25% of all plastic parts that fail, fail through environmental stress cracking. Um, the next uh, uh, cause is going to be a combination of, of really two, and that's notched static rupture and creep slash relaxation. The combination of those two, again, the exertion of static stresses on a part or static deformation accounts for approximately 22% of plastic part failures, almost as high. Um, next, we've got, uh, we've got uh, the combination of chemical attack, thermal degradation, and UV attack. 
uh, and that accounts for approximately 17% of plastic car failure through what I'll call molecular degradation mechanisms. Uh, there, in this case, the, the molecular structure uh, is compromised. Uh, those molecular weights go down either as, as a result of the molding operation or uh, degradation out in service. So our spaghetti noodles are chopped up, if you will, uh, and it mu becomes much easier to disentangle than, uh, to undergo disentanglement at that point. Again, 17%. And finally, uh, dynamic, dynamic fatigue, approximately 15%. So our big four in terms of plastic heart failure are environmental stress cracking, uh, static stresses, uh, molecular degradation mechanisms, and dynamic fatigue. Uh, and again, uh, through my experience, this, this, this table is, is right on the money. Um, this is a slide that, again, unfortunately, because we, you know, we only have an hour, um, this is a slide I really can't talk too much about, but is very, very important. And that's that uh, we, we choose plastic materials for a number of reasons, one of which is their inherent ductility. Yet most failures occur through brittle fracture. If we go back uh, to this table, environmental stress cracking is a brittle fracture mechanism. So, our, so generally our, our static stresses or, or creep failures, generally they are brittle. The molecular degradation mechanisms generally brittle, uh, as is fatigue. So, um, you know, why is it then that our, our ductile materials behaved in a brittle manner? That oftentimes becomes the, the thrust of the failure analysis, finding out what's caused this, this ductile to brittle transition. And there are a number of things that can happen, either during production or during service. Um, again, low molecular weight material selection, poor fusion or molecular entanglement, basically a, a knit line that a significant uh, severely or uh, non non well fused knit line uh, contamination increased level of filler uh, again that that happens as a selection process uh, when we're selecting materials stress concentration designs or defects or molecular degradation all those things can happen during production or essentially during design production things like that then during service. Uh, we can have uh, reduced uh, temperature. Uh, again, that leads to more brittle properties. Elevated strain rates, like I talked a little bit about with, uh, with snap fits. Extended time under stress, so that would be creep failure. Cyclic loading or, or fatigue. Chemical exposure, either through uh, chemical degradation or through environmental stress cracking. Loss of plasticizer, if the material changes through exposure to temperature, uh, high, elevated temperature, and it, it loses plasticizer. Or again, molecular degradation, whether it be thermal, uh, UV, chemical, uh, all of those can make the material more brittle. So uh, this ductile to brittle transition becomes very, very important. And like I said, is oftentimes the, the goal of the, of the investigation or, or is the object of the failure investigation. Let's talk a little bit about that failure analysis process now. So we've got a failed part. Now we need to figure out, you know, uh, what's going on. What is a failure analysis? It's simply the logical and systematic evaluation of a component and the corresponding documentation, getting all of that background information to detect, analyze the causes, the possibility of consequences of an actual or even a potential failure. Again, we talked about a failure can be if something is compromised in safety. And so again, that really represents what we'll call here a potential failure. So it's, it's again, the key things there, logical, systematic evaluation. That's, that's really the key part. Um, and that's, again, one of the key characteristics. We want to certainly also have analytical observation and testing, and we want that to be guided by sound engineering practices. Put all that together, and those are key aspects of the failure analysis. Um, you need to let the science direct the investigation. Again, um, we've all been in meetings, problem meetings, where a customer calls or, or something happens, and, and there's some failures, and we need to address them relatively quickly, if not immediately. Um, those meetings typically, that, you know, those problems typically happen on a Friday, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and uh, if you've been in one of those meetings, you know that there'll be people from design engineering there. There'll be people from manufacturing. There'll be people from, uh, from procurement or purchasing. Uh, there'll be manufacturing engineers there. If there's 10 people in that room, there'll be 10 different theories as to why that parts failed. Uh, you know, it'll be, well, the operator was tweaking the press again, and when they do that, then the material, you know, becomes brittle. Or, you know, that material was received uh, when it was raining outside, and when that happens, it always seems that there's, you know, there, there's some more failures. Or, you know, the customer is abusing the part. Again, lots of different theories. And if you go down one of those theories, if you act on one of those theories, and it's wrong, you've just wasted a lot of time and oftentimes a lot of money. Instead, Werner von Braun, a, a 
rocket scientists once said, one test result is worth 1,000 expert opinions. And that certainly, I certainly believe that that's true. Put some science behind the investigation and allow that to tell you, uh, you know, what's going on. The goal of the failure analysis then is to discern the mechanism and the cause of the failure. Essentially, the mechanism is how and the cause is why. How and why did this part fail? Well, why is the failure analysis important? Well, we certainly hope to solve the current problem with efficient use of time and resources. And that's oftentimes the number one knock on doing some testing, doing a failure analysis as well. You know, it's going to take too long. And it's going to cost too much money. Well, how much time does it take to, to, to follow up on test theories that are incorrect? How much, I've seen a lot of people try and solve the, the failure at the press. How much does press time cost? How much wasted material can there be? Again, putting some science behind it, I think, is the most, is the most efficient use of those resources. Also, generally, problems don't solve themselves. They usually only get worse. They may go away for a little while, but like the sleeping dog in the corner, they usually get up and come back to bite you in the butt. In addition to the solving the problem at hand, we also hope to identify ways to improve or avoid failure in current and future parts. One key way to do that is to advance your knowledge of materials, design, production methods, installation techniques, testing methods. We hope to use this mistake, this failure, and we hope to learn from it so that we can avoid problems in the future. And again, one of those key ways I think there is, is indicated there is, is the testing methods. Not necessarily the QC methods we use to test parts after they're produced, but instead I'm talking about prototypical type tests. How can we test the part before we release it to understand what the weaknesses of the part are and anticipate what failure might be? Um, so if we see some failures and we understand that they're associated with chemical contact, we understand now that we should have done some testing up front in order to identify that chemical contact was a problem. If fatigue stresses are a problem, again, we identify fatigue as the failure mechanism. We can identify different ways to account for that. If we found that the material was degraded during molding, we learn about that and we can learn to, to be able to correct that problem from happening again on this product or on future products. So again, the key here is learning something. As part of the failure analysis, we want to, we want to certainly um, identify certain things. We want to see, again, these four things be identified. What are the indicators of the symptoms? What was observed that indicated a failure had occurred? What were the consequences, the ultimate problem to be avoided? What are the mechanisms, essentially, how the, how the failure occurred? And the cause, what was determined to be the root cause of the failure and address these in corrective actions? We certainly don't want to get them confused. I see this all the time where somebody will get something, you know, they'll, the part will fail because of contact with a cleaning chemical, okay? And in the past, that hasn't been a problem, okay? So somebody right away says, well, you know, the failure, the cause of the failure was contact with the chemical. Well, underlying that cause was the fact that during the molding operation, this part was severely degraded. The material was degraded. And so it was inherently prone to the environmental stress cracking. That, that degradation then is really the cause, and the root cause might be that the press was out of control or the material wasn't properly dried. But again, don't, don't confuse the cause and the mechanism. That oftentimes I see people doing that. Then the steps we're going to conduct in terms of a failure analysis. First of all, we're going to collect the background information. I like to say that Conducting a failure analysis is a lot like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. The background information forms those corner and border pieces that allow us to interpret the rest of the picture, okay? They provide the context in which we look at all the data we're going to collect. So we need to understand things like what the material was, how it was produced, what the service conditions were. Was there always a level of failure at low, you know, at, at low percentages and now is higher? Um, has the part ever worked? Have we just made a design change? Have we changed anything about the process? Uh, again, uh, there's a hundred different questions that may or may not apply. But we want to collect all of that background information. Next, we want to do a macro inspection. This allows us to use the two most important tools in conducting a failure analysis, our eyes and our brain. Too many times I've seen it, and I've, I've been guilty of it myself, we want to rush right into doing a microscopic examination. We want to get some analytical testing done, all that cool stuff, all that, you know, stuff that you see on CSI. And instead, we, you know, in order to do that, we typically have to start cutting. 
And now we've just cut up our part before we've really had a chance to examine it. Take a second, step back and look at it. If I've got five failed parts, do they all fail at the same location? Do I see signs of obvious, you know, macro damage? Do I see some discoloration? What do I see about the part that might stand out? Certainly do that and take pictures while you're doing it. Next, we want to uh, we want to do some sampling. After we've looked at it thoroughly uh, and looked at it, you know, I would say the macro inspection includes both visual and you know low power microscopic examination up to about you know five to ten x. We're going to start to pick our samples out as we think about further testing, and then we're going to do more of a microscopic examination. This might be you know stereo microscope up to two hundred x, and maybe a scanning electron microscope, you know, which can be two thousand to ten thousand x maybe at the high end. So we start to, to pick out those details. Through the, the macro and the micro examination, we start to get a feel for what the mode of the failure was. How did it fail? Fatigue, creep, environmental stress craft. We start to get that information, how the part failed. Next then, we're going to get into doing some testing. We're going to look at composition. We're going to look at molecular structure. We're going to look at physical or mechanical properties of the part. We're going to do you know, that type of testing. And we're going to get the data that it tells us. Typically, that data tells us more about, about why the part failed. So the examination, the visual techniques, gives us more about, about how. And the analytical techniques gives us more about the why, typically. Then we're going to do a data review, determine those that mechanism and cause, put it all together. Uh, don't forget, it, it's oftentimes not just one factor that leads, to pla that leads to plastic part failure. Oftentimes, two or three things come together, and that's why we get failure rates of 1% a tenth of a percent, a hundredth of a percent. Uh, if, you know, if, if we had one factor, then we typically see a hundred percent product failure, or we typically see one part fail. It's when you get two or three things to come together and they overlap, that's when you get these relatively low, but often painful failure rates. We're going to walk through a couple of case studies now to illustrate the, uh, the points we were making uh, about uh, conducting a failure analysis. Uh, the first one is a pneumatic plunger, failed in service, uh, had a maximum pressure of approximately 120 PSI in the application. There was an increased level of failures in recent production. It was uh, produced from a polyacetal copolymer, um, either M25 or M25 UV. That's the UV stabilized material. Um, and so that's, that's some of the background information that we knew. Visual examination. Uh, indicated cracking within uh, generally consistent locations across all the parts that we were able to examine. I typically like to see as many parts as I can. Uh, so if you've got, you know, 12 failed parts, I typically visually and microscopically look at all 12. I, I won't necessarily carry the 12 through, you know, scanning electron microscopy or, uh, or analytical testing, but I want to see are all the parts failing in the same way? Are they failing at the same location? Does it look like it's the same mechanism? So in this case, it looks like that they did. The cracking extended through the internal connection end at, at, uh, at the valve seat location. From that uh, visual examination, we saw no signs of uh, macroductility. There was no stress whitening, permanent deformation. Instead, we saw features associated with, with uh, brittle fracture. Uh, a cracking initiated at a reinforcing rib and extended through the plunger wall. We can see that reinforcing rib uh, and then the cracking moving out in both directions uh, around the part. Significantly also we see a, a void. That, that smiley face feature that we see in the middle uh, is a void. It's not supposed to be there. More visual examination show defects on the part surface including hesitation marks, slow markings, poorly fused lines. These are all signs of deficiencies within the molding process and their presence uh, really represents potential weaknesses within the material uh, as molded. We did some CT imaging to allow us to look at the part uh, without having to cut it up and to see the whole part rotating it. Uh, you, you see just a, a piece of that uh, CT image there. Uh, and what we saw there was significant voids were detected within all of the components. That crescent-shaped void was adjacent to the origin. And really, uh, the crack didn't come out of the void, but really what it did is it, it it provided a lack of integrity within the part, a lack of support, such that, let's just go back here, such that, that the void really allowed bending within the part and produced tensile stresses out adjacent to that reinforcing rib and then cracking to occur. 
Uh, scanning electron microscopy uh, showed us the crack origin, again, at the edge of the rib. Morphology within that area was extremely smooth, characteristic of brittle fracture. Uh, uh, through a slow crack initiation mechanism, and there was no evidence to indicate substantial microductility. We're looking for stretched fibrils, uh, stretched flaps, something that indicates some ductility, and we did not see it. The mid-fracture zone showed some level of microductility in this overlapping morphology we can see here. Uh, so the material had some inherent ductility to it. Again, that ductile to brittle transition that we talked about is playing a role here, certainly. Uh, we did a test called infrared spectroscopy, or Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FTIR. Um, and uh, uh, we got results characteristic of a polyacetal resin. There was no evidence to suggest contamination of, that, uh, of the failed uh, or control uh, plunger materials. We did differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC. In this case, we're looking to evaluate the melting point, the FTIR tells us that it's a uh, um, it's a uh, uh, it's a polyacetal, but it can't tell whether it's a homopolymer or a copolymer. The DSC then, by melting point, uh, 164 was consistent with a polyacetal copolymer. The other significant piece of information we get here is the heat of fusion. In this case, it was 143.1 joules per gram. That's the energy required to melt the material, uh, and since only the semi-crystalline material uh, will melt, um, it's really an assessment of the crystallinity of the part. We take that and we heat it and then we control cool the part and then we heat it back up through melting a second time. And the heat of fusion here was significantly higher, 160.8 joules per gram, indicating that the, uh, that the part was under crystallized as molded. So it was probably molded in a relatively cold tool uh, and the material was not properly crystallized, which will compromise the mechanical property. We did some melt flow rate testing, which is going to be an assessment of the average molecular weight of the material. Uh, and we did um, uh, three plunger samples, and we got generally consistent results, uh, and those were in good agreement with uh, the, the data sheet value, the nominal data sheet value for, some con for silicon M25. So no evidence was found to indicate molecular degradation of the plungers. Our conclusion, oh. Doing this all the time. Excuse me. Uh, our conclusion then, in terms of the failure mechanism, uh, was that the uh, pneumatic plungers failed through brittle fracture via slow crack initiation mechanism. Based on the appearance of the fracture surface and the application, the parts were thought to have cracked through a combination of creep rupture and cyclic fatigue. So uh, it's going to be under some constant loading and then some intermittent loading also. So uh, that combination uh, caused the failure to occur. Uh, the failure across all three parts initiated the consistent location um, uh, at, a, at an area which acts as a point of stress concentration, uh, which focuses those applied stress. The cause then was identified as deficiencies within the molding operation. Uh, the presence of, uh, of high concentration of voids, again, a significant contributing factor as it loses integrity of the parts. Um, also, molding defects. Uh, such as the hesitation marks, the poor fusion lines, that certainly uh, weakens the material inherently as molded. And also, finally, the material was under crystallized. Again, also bringing down the integrity of the molded part and making it more susceptible to creep and fatigue failure. Uh, our second and last example then is a housing for an electrical appliance. Uh, failures occurred during assembly, the insertion of screws into the screw bosses you see here. The failures were limited to a particular production lot. They were injection molded from an ABS uh, resin. The grade was unknown, and regrind was allowed to be used in the, in the operation. The visual examination showed cracking within those screw brosses to have a brittle fracture appearance. No significant stress whitening or permanent uh, deformation uh, was observed, so brittle fracture within those screw brosses. FTIR then on the control base part, uh, which you see in the middle there, produced results characteristic of the ABS resin it's supposed to be. The failed parts uh, produced results indicative of the ABS resin with a contamination, which was indicated here by some extra absorption bands that are present. Um, we did a spectral subtraction. Uh, it was done, and the contamination was identified as a thermoplastic polyester, something like PET or B PBT. Those two materials uh, cannot be differentiated spectrally. So we did a DSC on the part, and the melting point then was indicative of uh, polybutylene terphthalate contamination uh, within the ABS resin. And that makes sense because plastic materials generally don't alloy or, or mix very well unless they're done 
unless it's done under very set conditions, uh, like the, the resin manufacturer might do. Certainly not, uh, not something that would happen out, uh, out in the field. Uh, then we did some thermal gravimetric analysis, or TGA, and that helps us to quantify various constituents within the material. We did this in a high resolution mode, and we were able to identify that the, that the failed parts consisted of approximately 24% uh, PDT. And this was a rather um, uh, severe failure for my customer. They had shut their assembly line down. And so this, this failure analysis, this evaluation was done in about uh, 24 hours. Um, they came to our facility and they brought with them the molder. Um, and uh, uh, the molder thought that they had identified the problem and they, they, they thought that vapors were spontaneously traveling, you know, about a thousand yards down the plant. Um, and they were depositing on these plastic parts and they were causing embrittlement. And they outlined what they were going to do with some paper curtains and some physical walls. And they were going to fix this problem and it wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to be an issue. And it was a quite an interesting story. Uh, again, they didn't do any testing, any evaluation of the part to come up with that theory. Um, and I let them finish because I don't want to be rude. Um, after they finished, I, I simply, you know, said, well, you know, this is what I found. And I found that the, um, that the ABS is contaminated with approximately 24% PDT. And they got a little red faced and then a little light bulb went on over their head that regrind is used at about 25%. And so that somebody must have dumped the wrong regrind because essentially all black plastics must behave in approximately the same way. And that's what, what happened. So the failure mode was brittle fracture associated with stress overload. The embrittlement factor here was contamination of the ABS molding with the PDT resin. Uh, uh, the source of the stress was a high strain rate screw insertion, but that really, again, this part should be able to withstand that. The failure cause then was contamination of the ABS molding resin with the other molding resin, likely as a result of improper regrind addition. Short term, certainly quarantine the parts. Long term, we could talk about that for an hour itself. Create safeguards to eliminate future contamination. Also decide what you're going to do with parts because while some failed immediately, it's likely that some may fail down the road. So, you know, after the part's been fully assembled because of the static interference stress between the screw and the boss. Um, that does it. I would like to just indicate that, um, you know, as Julia said earlier, I, I, I do give a series of presentations uh, through Society of Plastics Engineers. There are two that are coming up yet this fall um, that I, I thought you might be interested in. The first is ductile to brittle transitions. And I know we, we didn't really get to talk about those very much, but these, this is going to be done in two parts, each part an hour long. Um, and uh, we'll really explore what causes those ductile brittle transitions. We'll run through those different parameters I just talked about briefly. Uh, we'll be doing that there. And then in November, we'll be, I'll be giving one on environmental stress cracking. Again, the number one cause of plastic part failure. Um, I don't believe SBE has got the second one up yet. In either case, if you'd like more information about how to register, uh, and I'm not pushing this because I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't see anything if you sign up more, uh, that, that's not. I do this because I think it's, I probably, I promote these because I think that they, the more we know about plastics, the better the industry is going to be, the more robust parts we can make. So if you'd like more information about how to sign up for these, you can certainly contact me. You can email me or, or, or call me and I can help you contact the folks over at SPE. With that, I would be happy to take some questions. Wow, I, I don't typically get a, I don't I don't typically get applause on a web-based presentation. That's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I guess if there are any questions, um, please either enter them in your chat box, or um, I guess I'll take the first. You know, I would like to say, too, if, if anybody has questions, you know, down the road, or if you'd ever like to talk about, you know, plastic part performance or failure analysis or plastic materials in general, you know, I, my wife calls me a geek, and, you know, but I, I like to talk about, you know, plastics. I like to, you know, talk about failure analysis. So feel free to email me or call me, you know, um, that would be great. Yeah, I, I guess I will take, uh, I'll take a question for, um, from, from what we observe, observed. So, do you typically, from the two examples, the case studies that you showed, um, it seems like you had a, a approach where you first looked at 
um, molecular and um, just your observation. So that's the path that you always go first, I guess, um, uh, for all your, I mean, are those are those the ones that you would never skip, say, in, say, another plastics investigation where you don't know what the reason why and maybe the client suggests something else, but, you know. I sure. I mean, the things I the things I always do. I mean, if I've got a situation where I've got a failed plastic part, I'm always going to look at it. I'm going to look at it visually, and I'm going to look at it with a microscope. Microscope up to 200x. Okay. Um, if if from there um, I feel I have my answer is to if I've got a fracture and I understand the fracture, where it's coming from, where it's going, uh, the mechanism of the failure. I may or may not do scanning electron microscopy. Other visual techniques that I do sometimes are mounting and polishing cross sections. Very, very underutilized, but very, very powerful technique for plastic components. Um, so I, I may do those. Those are kind of my, my suite of visual and microscopic examinations. But I always, always going to look at the part and, and do some type of microscopic examination. In terms of you know analytical testing, uh, you know kind of the, the the big test that I do normally, but not all the time. It, each situation is different. Would be you know infrared spectroscopy, uh, differential scanning calorimetry, uh, DSC. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, T TGA or thermogravimetric analysis, and then some type of molecular weight evaluation like like melt flow rate. Those are kind of the you know the major tests that I do. But we certainly you know do a, a number of other ones also. Depending on each situation is different. Okay, but you generally just go from the least destructive to the most destructive at the very end for the I guess. Yeah, that I mean that that's kind of the logical approach. Yes. No, no problem. If, if anyone, by the way, would like, um, you know, a, a PDF copy of the of the presentation minus the minus the case studies, uh, again, just go ahead and email me, and I can I, I I'll send you that PDF copy. Okay, that'd be great. And I just want to take one quick moment to also um, announce for our upcoming uh, webinar, the, the fourth Thursday of next month in September. Um, we'll we'll it kind of comes in tandem with this would be. Uh, Actually, a, a presentation from Photomold, so um, it's going to continue with um, that theme. So um, I guess with that, um, thank you for your interest again, and um, thanks again to Jeff for great presentation. All right. No, thank. Uh, n no, uh, no, no problem. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. All right. Have a great Labor Day weekend. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.